Good morning, everyone. Um, excited to be here. It's a pleasure. Also humbled to be here speaking in front of a lot of uh, experts in your respective industries. Um, so as part of my role with the company, I'm also acting as a, a regional lead for North America in terms of automation. Uh, what that really entails is trying to educate ourselves and drive innovation and how to adopt it within our business. Uh, and we have a global community that gets together to share our learnings. So I kind of sit on that, that group there. So one of the technology that we found a lot of success in is um, with the uh, wearables. So today what I hope to do is just kind of share how our journey has been with adopting these wearable technologies and share a little bit of insight on how we'd like to progress going forward to take uh, more advantage of these technologies out there. Hopefully it's an experience that a lot of people can uh, you know, benefit from. Also to the vendor community, just to understand how the customers are thinking uh, with these tech emerging technologies. So just before we get deeper into the conversation, just wanted to talk about our organization a little bit. I think a lot of the folks in the room probably knows that we deliver packages, and we certainly do. Uh, but we also roll up to a larger organization under the brand of Doches Post DHL. So we're, we're really into four divisions or how we're organized. We have the German Post e-commerce fulfillment and parcel uh, business. We also have the Express that does the international courier service, basically. Also with the global forwarding and freight, so like your ocean containers, air freight. Mm -hmm. And the supply chain division that I'm part of, we're into the contract logistics for warehousing and warehouse transport. Just to give you an idea of our, our I guess, size and scale just for the supply chain division, we operate in more than 2,000 sites globally uh, for roughly about 1,500 of our customers. And we always design a tailored solution for our customers, meaning most of our sites are dedicated facility addressing specific uh, requirements for that business profile. <clears throat> so in our space of supply chain, what do we see in the market? Uh, I know Paul mentioned earlier about the importance of why, and this is why it, it drives us to get to all the innovations that are out there. <clears throat> so our supply chain is evolving. There's no question about that. These are the five areas that I think are kind of the major influence to, to the evolution of supply chain. First being the change in customer behavior and expectation. So e-commerce has been growing steadily, double digit growth year over year. It's chipping away at the, the bigger uh, retail sales portion of it. Uh, and with that, what's, what it's doing to the customers is it's giving a new expectation on the convenience side. So the customers are able to know the stock availability right away and can get the, sh the product shipped to wherever they wish. Uh, another thing that's emerging is the m-commerce as we're doing a lot of more shopping on mobile devices now. Uh, another thing that's kind of there as a traditional trade-off is you, know, you would have to pay for the expedited shipping uh, versus waiting for your delivery, but that no longer exists today because they found that a lot of the times when people are shopping online, when they get to the shopping cart or the checkout, um, they see that they have to pay for their delivery and they would just abandon it. So now you have companies that offer free shipping even to next day or even same day, and that's really changing the, the game. A lot of the companies will put a minimum requirement on, on the, the or amount to be eligible for free shipping. So what that's also causing is people buying stuff that they don't need just to get that minimum quantity to get the free delivery. And they're returning the product for free after uh, that they don't need. In the apparel business, it's another uh, challenge because people don't have to go into the stores anymore uh, to try the clothes before they buy. So they'll buy multiple sizes of the same clothing and then return the ones that they don't want. Now, in the distribution world, that can be a nightmare as it's hard to deal with all the returns that are coming back to us. Uh, labor market, you're going to hear this uh, in this conference already and in other industries. You know, it's a challenge. There's a declining population growth. Uh, they're expecting a massive wave of retirement in the next decade. Also, population, it's shifting towards the larger markets, meaning people are migrating towards larger cities, towns, metropolitan areas. For us in the distribution space, our Distribution centers tend to be away from those cities, so it's really impacting us a lot. And usually it's a concentration of uh, warehouses, so we're competing for the same labor market that's shrinking. Another thing about uh, labor market would be, you know, um, like the millennials. I won't talk about the stereotypes, whether good or bad. All to say that is we really need to change the way we think about building a culture with an organization to attract talent and have them stay with us for a long period of time. Uh, we talked about Uber earlier. They're kind of the trendsetter into this gig economy. 
Another challenge to how uh, it's really preventing us from getting a long-term commitment from a lot of the people that would come in and work with the companies. Changing logistics requirement, we're used to shipping larger pallets uh, traditionally. Now more and more we're having to deal or handle individual units at our distribution centers, and they're a very expensive way to fulfill an order, and also very labor intensive. Um, you know, a couple of reasons why it's kind of driven towards that e-commerce as we talked about, but not just e-commerce, you know, those uh, subscription-based ordering systems, you know, that will allow, that will cause us to handle things at a unit level as well. Uh, companies don't want to hold a lot of inventory anymore, so they're not trying to take, they're not trying to take advantage of the larger uh, economies of scale when they're trying to bulk buy, they're buying what they need. So it's a lot smaller quantity of handling units that, that we need to go after. Uh, and because of all of this, uh, a lot of the companies also are, sh you know, there's a buzzword of omni-channel. They're trying to get to that. Uh, include strategies like trying to fulfill an order out of their retail stores or, you know, doing some click and collect so that, you know, people can buy or, or order online and then pick it up at the stores. Another thing that I like to add here is you know, customers are less and less forgiving about late deliveries. So what that's causing us a problem is you know, we don't get the flexibility of smoothing out the workload over the period of a day or weeks. You know, once an order drops, we've got to get that out the door as quickly as possible. So it causes a lot of spikes, uh, you know, peaks and valleys in how we uh, or have to um, organize our labor pool. Um, so that's a big challenge that we need to address as well. Software intelligence, I won't spend too much time on that, but basically all the words like Internet of Things, uh, management systems, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, business analytics, and, and all that stuff. All that to say is it's really this emergence of this uh, intelligence is helping us to do the same work that we do today with the same tools, uh, but utilizing a lot of the data that's already been available and doing things the right way, being a little bit more smarter about what we do. Um, so we're having these bolt-on systems to our traditional WMSs that will give us more flexibility and capability to optimize some of the processes that we have in, in our facilities. Lastly, technological advancement. Uh, I would say you know, augmented and re uh, virtual reality and robotics, you know, self-driving vehicles are probably the primary uh, disruptors in our space today. And what's accelerating that disruption is the dropping price point on all these new technologies that are coming up in the market. So as DHL, uh, we've kind of identified five disruptions uh, that's playing a major role in our distribution space. So you have the drones, the robotics, autonomous vehicles, Internet of Things, and also, lastly, augmented and virtual reality, which I'm going to be talking about today. Just like to mention that we have this trend research group with our company. Basically, they're doing a lot of research on, on what's out there, what's up and coming, and we're being smart about when to engage these different things that are coming up based on the maturity and the readiness of the technologies or the solutions we're looking after. So there's a website there. Um, please feel free to go check that out. There's a lot of great material there. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of material on augmented reality as well. So getting into AR and VR, uh, personal experience, my earliest memory of virtual reality, or if you like to call it that, is watching the movie Minority Report. Um, what stood out to me was really there's a hologram visual display that wasn't just for the visual purposes, but a human operator could actually interact with it. And what I'm trying to get after with this point is I'm sure everybody in this room has an early memory 10, 20 years ago, whether Star Trek or other TV shows or movies, where something like this has stuck out to us. And I think the reason why it has is because it's got a great appeal. I think you know, it's a cool way to do things, but we also know um, that it could be a better way of doing things. And that was proven when this came along. So Pokemon Go was already uh, mentioned earlier today. Uh, and that kind of proved that you know, we're all really ready to kind of accept this appeal. Um, there was a max, so because of the demand on this, they maxed out on the server capacity. Nintendo stock went up like crazy. Um, the term came out of it called uh, accidental exercise. I'm sure you kind of know what that means if you play the game. Uh, but it also gave us a, a good learning experience uh, in a sense that when we try to deploy something or implement something, we got to do our homework because, uh, because of this gaming alone, there have been a lot of reports on injuries and, and even crime. So, you know, just got to, you know, really think out, uh, think holistically before we, we tackle anything like this. So, all of this said, uh, a fantasy now, virtual reality. I think gaming industry, I would say, is probably the prime and 
a real good example how virtual reality is coming into our, our homes. But just taking an example of in the football field, um, they're using virtual reality to do training. So not, they're able to practice drills and all of that stuff with, uh, without having the contact, uh, actual contact to prevent any injuries. Also, they're using it as a recruiting tool so that uh, you can give an experience of what it might feel like playing in that specific stadium, running plays or seeing the coaches on the sideline or what have you. So it's pretty interesting that the application of virtual reality is going far beyond that we'll be in this room could probably imagine. Just quickly on the wearable technology, I think it's just to kind of level set our understanding and make sure you know, it sounds right with all the folks in the room as well. So smart glasses, just a simple heads up display, uh, putting up uh, information in your field of view and that's really as simple as that. And then when it comes to augmented reality, it's when we layer in a computer generated information to the real environment around you and how we're seeing virtual reality is when the user is fully immersed into a, a virtual reality basically. And it's kind of important for us to, to classify this because uh, uh, as the slides go on, uh, I'll kind of touch up on how we're trying to use these three different areas and how to find homes uh, in our, in our uh, operations. So today in a warehouse environment, picking is the most labor intensive in the critical process. I'm sure a lot of the folks in the room might know that. We have four basic ways that we've been dealing at this uh, or going after this. So paper-based for a lot of simple, uh, low volume operations. RF tends to be our go-to solution. It's pretty flexible. It does what it's supposed to do and does it pr fr fairly well uh, at a reasonable cost. Uh, we have the voice headsets in an environment where it's critical to have the operator hands-free. So if you're dealing with a lot of heavy, bulkier items or uh, what have you, you know, we can see a lot of benefits there. And a lot of the light system that's very expensive uh, and you would need a lot of volume and skew count to justify. And from, from this traditional four where we're now getting into is a vision picking or what we're calling it as a vision picking and I'll tell you how we got there. So in 2014, trend research group that I talked about did some research on augmented reality, saw that there's a potential for us to bring in this uh, distribution and warehousing space. So in 2014, we partnered up with one of our customers and conducted a proof of concept. Uh, and my colleague Gina Chung was here uh, two years ago talking about that uh, proof of concept. We found a positive results out of it. So then we formed a global um, vision picking pilot program uh, and we conducted uh, or we, we, we kind of identified multiple sites across the globe on where we could test these uh, vision picking solution out at. And last year, George Bowser from uh, DHL came uh, and he talked about that. And I'm here this year to talk about the results of the successful four deployments that we had across the globe. Uh, and also to tell you that as of this year, DHL has made vision picking one of our standard offerings. Just quickly, this kind of follows the, uh, the process we like to go through when we're trying to adopt a new technology, starting with the research, then the proof of concept, and once that's there, we do pilots to get the result and, and try to understand and, and see the impact of it. And once it's favorable, we try to productize and then start rolling it out to our network. Here's a slide that kind of summarizes our vision picking program. It's a little outdated, um, but I will talk more in detail uh, as we go through the slides. Just I'll mention the, the, the four pilots that we, we ran. Uh, we did one site, a retail customer here in North America, and other consumer technology customers out in the European region. So highlighting some of the solution uh, benefits and advantages. So our vision picking program, or, or solution I should say, basically gives all the information that a picker needs to complete their task, and it's presented in a manner of a more of a graphical presentation. So we found that it's a, it's a lot more intuitive than trying to you know, decipher more um, textual information. Uh, and really taking the best of all worlds between RF and voice and also adding the benefits of having a heads up display unit. So there is a uh, built in microphone. I think uh, a gentleman earlier talked about uh, how, how great it is to have those voice commands and I completely agree. So we, can, we definitely use that. Um, we are also able to use the built-in camera to scan barcodes, but we as an organization decided to use more of a Bluetooth ring scanner, primarily because of the ergonomic reasons. If you think about a, a racking shells where the barcode might be on the very low level, you don't want everyone to kind of bend down or, or bend their neck uh, in a weird way to scan. So just having that um, a ring scanner with you, we found it to be more effective um, and it's also faster. 
couple other highlights here or advantages. So very flexible in customizing the UI. Uh, we could basically have a, a graphical representation of what you see in reality. So here you can see how the, the display shows you the configuration of the pick cart that we're picking to, and it helps you kind of sort through it faster than, again, showing off a numeric uh, information that you have to kind of think through. So it's a lot more intuitive that way. Also with the voice commands and other uh, more visual dependency, it kind of eliminates the need for our language dependency. A lot of us, our sites might have um, you know, our associates where English isn't their primary language, but this way kind of mitigate the, the need for that. One other thing that I like to say is, you know, as we work through implementing these different solutions, we have to integrate it with our WMS, but there exists a middleware now. And we take advantage of that to do a little bit more optimization than what our traditional WMS could. And it's really good because we don't have to kind of cut through multi-million dollar WMSs, but we can simply allow these middleware to help us do things a little differently so it's either uh, eliminating some of the tasks that was required prior or just kind of rethinking the whole process in general uh, has helped us a little bit. Here, just a sol solution architecture real quick. In terms of hardware, we've been using Google Glass and also the Vuzix. Started with the 100s, now we're getting to the 300s. Uh, I'm sure you guys all know that the battery life of these aren't uh, long enough to last a full shift. So we have an external battery pack that will get us through eight to 10 hours of our working shifts. Uh, and the ring scanner that I talked about. Uh, in terms of the pilot program and a couple of our initial rollouts, we partnered up with UVMAX and they've been our software and integration provider for us. Uh, and recently we've done some deployments out in Asia and I think we, were uh, we worked with Upscale to do that. Integration side, um, really just simply, we just need Wi-Fi connection to be communicating to these devices and taking their information from WMS to, to roll out that information to the glasses. So vision picking results and findings from our pilots and some of our early deployments. Uh, we've tried it out across multiple order types, so not just the you know, same type of business across the board, but we've done it with retail orders, wholesale orders, e-commerce orders, which have its own characteristic or uniqueness about how to handle those uh, type of orders. We've done also in the terms of the process, uh, discrete order pick, batch picking, cluster picking, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we in integrated with our WMS and our two primary WMSs are Manhattan and JDA. Uh, we've rolled it out in North America and European region and now into Asian Pacific as well. And we've worked with uh, clients across the board from our retail sector, consumer, and technology space. Quantitative results. So we've definitely seen productivity improvement in terms of picking. Um, we've seen anywhere from 7 to 15% productivity improvement. We're able to obtain high pick accuracy by using these glasses. Um, also, reduction in training time. I think this is something that can be uh, somewhat underestimated, uh, but I think you've heard other speakers throughout this conference how critical that is, is because you know, we talked about those seasonal peaks that we have to go through. So if you have to bring in seasonal workforce regularly, you have to const constantly train new people to, to work in our warehouse. And if we're able to cut that time by half, you know, that's a huge saving and benefit for us. Qualitatively, it's all around really user satisfaction and health and safety. You can see on the bottom right corner there, we did some uh, usability feedback uh, surveys from our uh, members that use the technology, and they came back pretty favorable across the board. Uh, we've also had physicians come in and do assessment on our associates just to make sure that we're not um, overlooking any um, potential hazards. And you know, I think what, what was found is that as long as we train our associates to take breaks appropriately, uh, we don't see a concern for long-term health effects. So where are we going with all of this? Uh, so in terms of augmented reality, some of these are already kind of in the development or design phase. Some of them are uh, a little bit on the more of a you know, brainstorming uh, phase. But really just loading assistance and pallet building, helping us to cube out our loads a little bit better, building more stable uh, loads. Kidding and VAS, uh, just providing step-by-step -step instruction to our associates so that they could do their job uh, properly. Uh, whether it's packaging or putting together a kit that needs to go out to a customer. A remote maintenance process, I think everyone's familiar with that. Navigation, so what we're trying to do is not just uh, giving an alphanumeric location for somebody to figure out how to get there. 
you know, what if we give indication with arrows and, and pointers and markers so that you know, they don't really have to think through anything, they just kind of follow the markers to get to the location they need. Um, so yeah, I, I, we, we see that as a good benefit. Optimization logic and algorithms, that could go uh, again with the middlewares. Uh, we're looking into that. And lastly, pull all application. So if it could eliminate the need of an expensive light system, you know, that could be a tremendous uh, help for us. In terms of virtual reality, I'll touch on two main areas. So virtual training environments, I think it was mentioned yesterday as well. If we're able to create a safe, controlled environment to do training, we have a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, things like, you know, you don't have to disrupt your operation to, to train somebody. Uh, number two, you don't have to dedicate that training space for every site that you run. You could have a more centralized or mobile place where you could do that. Also, if you're training somebody to work with hazardous materials, you know, this would be a safe environment to do that initial training before they actually get on the floor. For virtual design and demonstrations, this is where we really want to use it to uh, give, give a chance for our stakeholders to visualize our solution before we bring it to life. So, you know, looking through the warehouse that we design, all the process that happens within it, and also be able to run simulations and look at alternatives, uh, we see that as a, a, a pretty good benefit and a good potential for us to look at. So some key t takeaways here. Um, so I think it's proven that there definitely is a use case for you know, wearable technology in our distribution space. Uh, and then there are clear benefits that you know, as we mature as end users of these products and we see the vendor community uh, maturing with the solutions, I think we're, we're going to gain more and more benefits out of these. Um, right now, it is an alternative. So as I mentioned earlier, RF device tends to be our, our kind of the primary or standard solution. But now we see the potential as you know, wearable technologies get better. Uh, it could be the new norm in the future for us. Uh, and then lastly, we saw a great technological advancement with this field in the past five years, and we don't see any reason why it would slow down. So I think it's important that we stay involved now so that we don't fall behind the game. And it's an exciting time for us to be constantly looking at you know, how else can we leverage these type of technologies so that they'll just help us make, uh, help us make uh, better solutions and offer that to our customers. So with that, if there's any questions, I'll take them now. So do you see um, the wearables potentially replacing your handhelds in the future? Is that what you said or not? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, and how soon would that be? So in the sites that we have deployed it, it's already happening. <clears throat> I guess the point I was trying to get at is by default when we're putting together our solutions, we're, we're automatically starting with RF guns as our, our uh, baseline. And we're trying to look at whether vision is the right way to go. Uh, but in the future, it might not even that case where we automatically know vision is going to be the right way to go. Yeah. Uh, I wondered, so from in terms of uh, the developments that you were looking at for the navigation, it seems like you have a, like a, a known universe of where you're operating inside of your warehouse facilities, mm -hmm. very well documented, and you can scan those pretty well. How far along? and? You know, are there limitations or barriers that you're finding in terms of like navigating through that space and, and, uh, uh, and creating specifically that user navigation field? Sure. Uh, so quite honestly, it's probably something I can't speak too much into at the moment. Um, but we are exploring in a way where um, we know there is going to be extra markers that's going to be needed in the warehouse. Uh, we, we know it's something where you can't just bring in these devices and we'll kind of figure out how to navigate through a warehouse. So it's for us kind of in the stage of, if that's the case, what do we need to change ab about our current infrastructure if needed? Uh, and what does that mean? And how does that help us in terms of benefits? Can we actually get to what we need to with the precision that we're looking at? Yeah. Yeah. Near the end there, you stated that you're going away from RFID towards vision and wearables. Is there a reason that you found for that, or is there an opportunity to use wearables with RFID? So, so it's actually RF units, not RFID. Um, so those uh, handheld devices uh, that are using radio frequency to um, interact with our, our systems. Uh, and you know, I wouldn't say we're trying to get away from it, uh, but really it's, it's kind of trying to find out what is the best solution. You know, not to compare with anything else, but you know, with what we know today, 
if we're putting together a solution for a customer and insert certain uh, operating profile, what is the best way? And is that an RF device or is it a vision? So I wouldn't really say it's, a, it's, a, it's an intent to shift away from what we did today, but it's more like now we have another uh, solution that's available to us. And, and you know, part of me think you know, that could be the next norm, and, and that's just what I was trying to make uh, our point on. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hi. I'm Zach Woods from Avonic, a large chemical company. Um, you didn't talk so much about track and trace or connectivity in the supply chain. Um, I would love to hear DHL's perspective as a transporter of goods as well as a picker and selector of goods of how you see you guys developing those type of technologies as a service offering to your clients. Um, because I know for sure that we within our organization are looking at a lot of our third-party logistics providers and saying we are actually pushing them to put those technologies in their service offering to us for temperature, pressure, vibration, etc. So mm -hmm. if you could elaborate a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, and I would completely agree. Um, so within our supply chain division, that's a little bit less on the, of a focus. But as a DHL organization, it's, it's definitely on the radar. All right, global IT group and you know, center of excellence, they're all looking at those. Tied to like Internet of Things, but really, as you said, um, how do we you know, connect all the, uh, the inputs that we have in our business and bring it to a centralized um, information hub to be able to get after what you're, you're saying? So um, it, it's in the works. Uh, it's definitely uh, something that we are working on. I'm um, not sure if I can elaborate more on that. Uh, and not because of, you know, uh, confidentiality, it just more of, you know, I have to be honest, that's not area of focus of mine that I can speak uh, further into. Okay. Justin, thank you so much. Great. Thanks very much.